BWI Daily Edition. Usually we end the show and end the week with Ryan Snyder talking about recruiting on Fridays, but a bunch of cool stuff happened this week. Super Bowl. Nate, I don't know how to do numerals. What's the Super Bowl this year? What's what's 54? It is uh, L-V-I. Yeah, yeah. I, 56. I, 56, L-V-I. okay. That's I, what I, I, I was... Literally, the only reason I know is because I watched the... I mean, painfully, uh, and a NFL honors <laughs> award show right. last night uh, right. to see if Michael Parsons would win defensive player of the year. He didn't, but he did win defensive rookie of the year as a unanimous selection. And yeah. I overlooked it. Keegan-Michael Key, Penn State alum, yeah. was the host. So, you know. It was mostly a waste of my time, but <laughs> yeah, award shows, Pro Bowls. I, I don't necessarily t- tune in for those things, although uh, I got the majority of what I needed from you and then from Twitter this morning with Micah's acceptance speech, which was heartfelt, sincere and well said. So, yeah, but good for him. The point yeah. about Super Bowl 56 is we're getting a preview of the game from Solomon Wilcox. He's on Radio Row this week. He's a former NFL safety. Bengals great was the starting safety in the Super Bowl the last time they were there in 1989. And he's going to join us later in the show to give us a preview of the game and talk about Penn State safety Nick Scott, who's been on a roll in the postseason. So stay tuned for that. But Every week we get your mailbag questions in, and because we didn't do it yesterday, I didn't want to forget about you, so that's what we're doing today with Nate. We're answering the mailbag before we get to Solomon Wilcox. So, Nate, are you ready? I I don't know, but I'm going to try. Okay. Well, let's let's dive right into it with the questions, and we'll find out if you're going to sink or swim. Let's get over to our questions then and start this off with, I I think this is a pretty good one to start with, and this is from Old Frog 26 one of our message board members. I should say, if you ever want to get a question in on uh, the mailbag section of the BWI Daily Edition, you can be a member at the Lions Den message board. I put out the bat signal in there. And then, of course, on Twitter, at Thomas Frank Carr, if you want to ask a question and just check out Wednesday nights, or in this case, Thursday nights, about when we'll be doing this. Okay, first question. If Penn State were able to land a Mike linebacker in the transfer portal at the end of the spring semester, is there enough time for that player to learn the defense and be impact an impactful player when the season opens at Purdue. That, we found out yesterday, is going to be a Thursday night game, Nate. Uh, I'll answer this one, but do you have any yeah. thoughts to start? Sure. I, You know, look, I, I think experience matters. So, yes, if if Penn State landed a Mike linebacker that had three, four years of, of college football playing experience, not just being in a system, but playing, right. then sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think certainly that's a possibility. It's just... It's hard to answer hypotheticals like that because you you don't know who the player is, right? Right. I mean, it's just it's a it's a faceless, nameless person. Um, but I would say that if that was going to be a likely scenario, that would be the baseline that right. would have to be worked. That that was going to be my answer. Is they're not going to get a guy in the portal that can't do that because that's the reason they need him. So it would be a yes or it's not happening, and they're going with the guys on the roster. So there's only one answer here, just based on you know, kind of the, not just the scenario, but the reality that faces Penn State. And to be, to be, to be honest with you, there haven't been a lot of linebackers in the portal this year. They're looking at a couple of defensive ends. We know the, uh, the uh, Grayson twins, I want to say from Texas, uh, North Texas, pass rusher, linebacker, hybrid players. So those are the guys. And of course, Tyler Steen, we're still talking about the opportunity there for Penn State to add another offensive lineman, another tackle in the uh, portal. So those are the just general portal talk. But yeah, I think that's a pretty uh, a nice over the middle plate question for us to start here. Nate. Next one. This one's going to be interesting. Which kid or kids from the 2020 O-line class are under the most pressure to have a big spring session? You cannot say all. He will Stephen A. Smith you. Uh, 
Uh, so I'm going to answer this one first. And so that everybody knows this is from Pocono 574 on our message board forum. So that everyone's on the same page. This is the 2020 offensive line class. You have, uh, it's a big class. Tackle Olaf Ashanu, Ibrahim Traore, and Jimmy Christ. And then interior players, Golden Israel Achumba and center Nick Dawkins. These are the guys that we're talking about here. Uh, and the reason is these are all now redshirt sophomores. They've been in the program for three years, guys that needed to reshape their body, add weight, do whatever they needed to do. They've had that time to do it. And the only guy so far <laughs> that's a part of the conversation is the obvious one of Olaf Ashanu. Uh, when it comes to as the most pressure, uh, I don't think the tackles are under a ton of pressure right now because there's nobody there's nobody pushing them at the moment. Traore and especially Chris is the guy that I think everyone has their eye on as a right tackle. There's th if Penn State gets somebody in the portal, that's a different conversation. But these guys, there's there's nobody leapfrogging them yet. Achumba and Dawkins, Penn State's brought in a lot of interior players, so the pressure I would say is on them. Do you have any thoughts on this, or how do you want to answer this one? Yeah, I would. I mean, I think that it would. It, it's the opposite is is how I will will frame it in that. The pressure is on them if they on the tackles, right? So Fashadu, yeah. if if he wants to be an impact player for Penn State, this is it. <laughs> like th this is the shot. This is the time that that uh, has to happen. And so certainly these next you know what eleven weeks of winter workouts and spring practices are going to be essential for him. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it is uh, cannot stress enough how much that's needed. And then no, that, I mean, maybe to your point, and I think we're probably actually saying the same thing, but like for Achumba and Nick Dawkins, because there are so many other personnel, right. Yeah. That are in those positions, they, you know, it, it, maybe they take a step, maybe they don't, but certainly from Penn state's perspective, there's a little more wiggle room there in terms of if they don't pan out. Yeah. That, I think you're that, kind of looking at it from the, from the offense as a whole, <clears throat> excuse me. And from the, 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 maybe the coach's perspective of, okay, we feel a little bit better about the interior. Cause we got guys, we don't have to rely on these two from yeah. the personal perspective. There's almost no room at the end. You know, yeah. Penn State has gone aggressively after offensive linemen. A lot of them have been, you know, on the interior, whether that's by necessity or availability. That's kind of the conversation we can have about the tackles in general, which we've had all offseason. But, yeah, I, I think that it's kind of the same thing, but looking at it from two different angles where uh, Jimmy Chris still has some time to develop because there hasn't been anybody that's came in and been, uh, you know, pushed him further down the depth chart as of yet. Uh, when it comes to the offensive line, I've been asking people this, this season. I want to get your opinion on this. Now that Hunter Norzad is in the program, Penn state has had some success in the recruiting world, not just in the future classes, but at the national signing day with Yuane, is there, is there a different outlook for you on the offensive line after these developments? Do you expect or do you think it's fair to think there's going to be a better production on the field next year with the guys they brought in? Hmm. Maybe. It, it feels to me as though the circumstances of limited depth have not changed. And yeah. so, like, that, that's the... That's the overriding factor to me is Penn State went into the 2021 season hoping that it would have eight, nine, maybe 10 players who could all play that there that not necessarily that there would be a huge rotation, but that they would have options. And, you know, uh, Anthony Wigan didn't work out right in, in the first half of that Wisconsin game because Sal Wormley got hurt and all of a sudden you're on your third guard <laughs> and it just it kind of deteriorated from there right and so yeah. now now um you know Rashid Walker is out of the picture and so I, I think that there are certainly players who you would pencil in today as probable starters but I, I don't I don't know what the depth looks like behind them to keep pushing it right i mean it's it's almost to the point where all of those top line players 
have to work out and yeah. have to be good. And yeah. I, I don't, you know, I, it just feels a little early right now to project whether or not that's going to come to fruition. I guess the, 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 the additions on the interior have more talent than I was expecting after watching some of the film. And with that in mind, you do have maybe two or three deep there of players that that are Big Ten caliber, depending on where Salim Wormley comes back in his development process from his injury, from his rehab process, which means a Landon Tangwall, while you want him starting at right guard or left guard, if somebody gets injured or there's some sort of problem at the perimeter, he showed that he's more than up to the task of playing that tackle position. So I guess I'm looking at the depth and flexibility of the interior and what that does for you on the perimeter. It's not elite, but I, I just I see more combinations and possibilities for success going forward. So I guess that's a kind of how I viewed this with with the additions and the, and the wins they've gotten recently. Going on to one of our famous uh, Barniak twins, who I did find out after last week's mailbag, are in fact twins. So I was not wrong. They are in fact twins and both asked a question this week. Andrew asked a question this week on Twitter. Do you anticipate Penn State hiring another additional analyst or staff member with Franklin's push for increasing staff overall like other big time programs? Any ideas uh, about who that might be? Maybe some other Penn State greats? Maybe uh, bring in, I don't know, Kajana Carter? Uh, Bobby Ingram, although he's he's with Wisconsin now. Yeah, What's your thought? I think he's gonna. T- I think he's gonna take that OC OC right. Yep, I think. offensive coor- yeah. offensive coordinator at Wisconsin. So just in general, I think we'll we'll address the first half of this question. Do you think that they're going to have additions to the staff? What past what they've done already? Uh, yes, they always show up. I mean, there's just so much that happens outside of the view of the, right, the public and the media, like, I mean, yeah. the Ken Wisenhunt thing to me was so fascinating last year. Uh, you know, it was just there. <laughs> like, I mean, literally somebody asked me in September, like, Hey, have you noticed uh, a former famous person uh, kind of roaming around on Penn state sidelines? And I was like, no, like, what are you talking about? It's like, Oh no. Hey, Ken Wisenhunt is one of the analysts <laughs> and yeah. there's like a running joke uh, as to whether or not anybody is going to ever notice the fact that a former head coach in the NFL is currently, you know, kind of helping out the, with Penn State staff. He's not even the the first famous former NFL coach that's been on the staff. Uh, there's been other uh, offensive coordinators uh, previously, too, that I think were were on the staff in the last couple of years, yeah, although the, the names are escaping me at the moment. Yeah, me too. The um, the his son was a quarterback at IUP, and so he ended up spending some time here and just just helping out pitching in. I mean, I think that the the distinction that you're seeing with the three hires that happened this week is rather than just picking up, um, I, this is not the right word, but I'm going to say it anyway. Like some stragglers, right? Some- People who are in between. In between Guy, jobs. Guys who are in like the that. limbo of their career, too. You know, Wisenhunt, yeah. a former NFL head coach that has apparently ran out his time in the NFL looking for opportunities to be a part of football in a, in a big way. Just staying in the game. Exactly. And they don't necessarily need the money. And so that, right, like, so that has kind of been what the standard has been for Penn State's analysts. Now it is more of a concerted effort. Right. The, yep. the, the three people that they brought in were brought in for a purpose. I think the budget has increased in terms of what is available f- for analysts. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that maybe you won't see analysts that have like if more hires happen in the analyst uh, realm, it would be more from that straggler side of things, the limbo side of things, yeah. than the purposeful ones. Yep, and we did mention earlier in the week that Penn State has also put out a uh, hire for a director, a data scientist, essentially, for analytics, in-house analytics. So that's another thing yep. we'll hear at some point. Somebody's going to get hired. I, But that's, that's not going to be like a former player, though, right? Like, that's going to be somebody who is right has a phd in math or something right you know well maybe john urschel look at that i mean there's a guy that, that fits the criteria of both although it might be a step down from being on the college football playoff committee 
You're being an analyst. Some, yeah, something tells me that John <laughs> Urschel has higher, different aspirations, but I, I'm not sure. Yeah. We'll uh, see. We've got five questions today, so we're burning through them, but we'll get to the next one. Uh, this one from Yingling Lasagna on Twitter, which sounds like a... I'm hoping you're having Yingling with your lasagna and you're not making... Yingling lasagna, lasagna, because I, I, I mean, I red wine in the sauce for your pasta is fine, but uh, Yingling in the sauce, and I'm, I'm, I'm out. Okay, so he asked, do we have a percentage on personnel groupings? I, I, I'm, I'm all. If I see a weird name from Twitter or whatever, I will be talking about it. Uh, do we have a percentage on personnel groupings from last season? I heard you mention recently that PSU's playbook was too expansive. Were there, uh, were there a lot of multiple? Uh, you, Sorry, were there a lot of multiple this year under Yersich? Yur Can we expect to see any pistol formations under Mike Yersich? So asking about if the if the playbook is too big and if uh, Penn State is going to be a little more diverse in their formations as opposed to previous years when uh, they've been pretty static, you know, under Joe Moorhead or Ricky Ronnie, pretty static formations. So before we get into that, I do need to say, first off, if you want to get in-depth information about Penn State football, make sure you subscribe to Blue White Illustrated so you can get my you can get these thoughts. You can ask these questions of me or Nate or Ryan or Greg or Dave over at bluewhiteillustrated.com. Sign up for just one dollar and get 12 months of access. That is an awesome deal for you to get all that information for a dollar. I had somebody do the math for me because Google couldn't do it. Speaking of analytics. You know how, how many, we put out like 10 to 12 articles a day, right? Over at the site. At least. At least. And one of those articles is a 35 to 45 minute podcast. So you're getting a ton of content for a dollar. The math is like fractions of a penny. So sign up now. It's in the video description. Scroll down past all of the words telling you what we're talking about today. Click on that link. You'll go to bluewhiteillustrated.com, sign up for a dollar, you'll get all this information, and then some of your questions can be answered in real time. I want to get back to this question, though, and here's, here's the thing. When I was talking about Mike Yersich's playbook previously on the show, I was saying that when Penn State was struggling, my opinion was that they should pare things down, simplify, and get good at what Mike Yersich likes to call. So the inside zone, the outside zone, work on those things, get better at those. I was not saying that I thought they do too much because it's better to be able to do everything. Like in the NFL, and this was my comparison, in the NFL, the playbook is everything. Offensive linemen and quarterbacks and receivers are expected to know how to run every route and how to uh, block every uh, scheme. And, and the quarterback has to know all of those things. In college, you have to make some choices. And in the NFL, you have to choose what you want to be great at and what you want to major in, what you want your, your PhD in football to be about, but you should be able to do any of these things in certain situations. I don't think that Penn State was too multiple last season. In fact, different formations, being able to disguise things is a good thing. And with a 60-year quarterback, I would think as long as the veteran offensive line comes together for them, that's an advantage they'll have coming into next season. Uh, pistol formation? Nate, what, what was James Franklin's uh, comment about Mike Yersich earlier this year? If he's a creative guy and he hasn't seen a play he doesn't like? Something like that. Boy, that one's escaping me. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, he... Loves offense, obviously. And yeah. so, yeah, I think there's there are certainly lots and lots and lots of things that are in his arsenal. He 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 enjoys wasn't wasn't there a conversation at some point about him liking to draw plays in his free time? Like, yeah. Yeah. So uh, sitting, in, sitting at home in general, that's the kind of guy that Mike Yersich is. So, yeah, I think you'll see evolutions and creativity in the offense, especially in the passing game, is one area that I think I've seen a lot of diversity from Mike Yersich. And then when it comes to the running game, figuring out, this was my comment previously, they run a lot of man and zone blocking schemes. Penn State under James Franklin over the last couple of years has developed a reputation of running a lot of power and counter and things like that. And Mike Yersich and before him, uh, Kirk Shiraka both ran a good bit of zone. You know, much more of the outside variety than Penn State had run previously. So my my whole comment was the observation of that and that Mike Yersich 
ran a lot less zone than he has in his career. So finding that balance is really what I was talking about. Not that, because if they could be good at all of it, then run all of it because you'll be able to beat the defense no matter what they're trying to run. Last question we got here. Do you have anything to, to wrap that up? No, I just, I, I certainly I thought that they, there were wrinkles to what we had previously seen last year, right? I mean, yeah. uh, certainly the the two running back set uh, with the, the quarterback and the shotgun. Um, what's that formation called? Do we, is that, is there a name for that? A double, a double shotgun? Uh, which one? I'm sorry. Which one? Uh, flanked left and right running backs. I think, of the I think they called that the full house or something like okay. that. I mean, it, it has a bunch of different names, but what it is, it's a balanced running formation where you can run left or right and have a lead blocker. It's just the variety of the personnel. I, I love that formation. That's the one I think that when he was talking, when Mike Yersich was talking last season about going into the all sports museum and going to rip angles playbook. And he saw something eerily similar that is kind of a throwback formation. So I think that's uh, that's that's what, you know, in general, that's the creativity you're getting with Mike Yersich. Yeah, concur. Let's move on to our last question. With the offseason comes a heightened look at strength and conditioning program that has been one of the best in the country. From what you can gather, how has the move from Galt to Losi gone over? And are there other strength and conditioning, coach, conditioning coaches that are sought after? Uh, I'm I'm gonna let you handle this one. I'm not uh, terribly familiar with that last part, but as far as what I've seen, and we haven't been able to, you know, go to the lifting sessions and, and the max out tests yet. That comes later in the month. It seems like everything is operating the exact same way it did previously under Galt. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I think that the purpose of making an internal hire and specifically a person who had worked alongside Galt for the previous 11 years was to not miss a beat. Yeah. Right. Agreed. I mean, uh, maybe could Penn state have looked outside and tried to find someone else, um, you know, or, or like targeted someone with a reputation as the best in the country, maybe, but my guess is, and again, this is like kind of purely speculation. They probably think that, that Chuck is the best. <laughs> right. Like I mean, right. that, that whole, that whole, uh, sequence of events suggests pretty strongly that they think extremely highly of him and what his capabilities are. Yeah. Obviously as an offshoot of a guy in Dwight Galt, who they also thought the world of. So, um, yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think that you, you always see, um, you know, in the preseason and, uh, different documentary or like whenever, whenever somebody's program has kind of a national spotlight on it, like the, um, the hard knocks series for college football that happened a few years ago, like the strength coach often takes a center stage because yeah. these are nut jobs. And also guys. they have the most contact with the players because there's not a restriction on the number of hours that they're allowed to interact in the off season. So they're, they're with they're, the players all the time. Yeah. They're high energy like I, I think they want to be described by their players as a little bit nutty, right? Like yeah. a little bit crazy. Uh, yeah. And so to lift that yeah, much no, weight, I, you've got to be. If you're the if you're the guy getting everyone hyped to to bench five hundred pounds or four hundred pounds, that is not a normal activity for most people. Yeah. 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 No. So they they uh, they got the guy that they wanted there, and you know, I think I think uh, all signs have been that things have gone well from that end. I would agree, and I would say that the the show has gone well. That's a good mailbag. Great questions. Thank you again for everyone that submitted those from both our Lion's Den message form and, of course, from Twitter. If you want to get your questions on the air, the best way is to, to subscribe to Blue White Illustrated and to sign up for a dollar, go into the message board form, and uh, ask a question there. And, of course, if you're watching this show and you've gone through the mailbag, you like the video. And I got even more fun stuff coming up next with Solomon Wilcott. So make sure you subscribe here on the Blue White Illustrated YouTube channel. Hit the subscribe button and like the video. Super helpful. Send us into the weekend on a good note. Uh, Ryan, uh, Ryan, geez, I'm so used to this being Friday and being Ryan. Nate, any last thoughts before we uh, move on today? That's all. I still have a toddler at my house. So <laughs> if you happen to hear 
There she is. Uh, any any exuberant, gleeful outburst that was her. No, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Well, uh, we'll get into our interview now with Solomon Wilcox about Super Bowl 56. Right here on the Blue White Illustrated Daily Edition. BWI Daily Edition Super Bowl Preview. Super excited. Not only are we getting to go to Radio Row today, but we're also getting to talk to uh, one of my favorite broadcasters, Solomon Wilcots, uh, who is, uh, you've known him for years on CBS and Sirius XM and a bunch of different places, Emmy award-winning broadcaster and was the starting safety for the Bengals in Super Bowl 23. Four tackles in the game, held Jerry Rice and Joe Montana to just 20 points in that game. Uh, welcome. Appreciate you coming on the show today. Thomas, hey, thanks for having us both on the show. We're glad to be with you. Yeah, and of course, uh, we have Wasak Al-Sadiq, Dr. Wasak Al-Sadiq here uh, to talk about BioHeart, heart rate monitor. We'll get to that in just a little bit. But Penn State fans uh, always wanted to see former Nittany Lions doing well in the NFL. And a guy who has had a long road to where he is right now, former Penn State safety Nick Scott, has had a very good playoff so far. One reception allowed for two yards, two pass breakups, and an interception uh, in the playoff so far, according to PFF. Take us through what you know about his game and how he's translated so well into the Rams' defense. Yeah, you remember last year, John Johnson was uh, the starter here, and then you know Jordan Fuller earlier in the year, and Nick has kind of worked his way in to the rotation, right? Kind of um, getting spot duty, and then due to injuries, um, been given an opportunity to become a starter. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I think he had already earned the opportunity but you only can play so many guys at a time. So, But they were making sure that they were able to get Nick Scott on the field. And then when the injury occurred to Jordan Fuller, of course, now he's able to play more full-time. And the more you see him and the more he plays, the more plays he's able to make. Finish the season with three interceptions. You already gave the numbers for what he's done in the postseason. He's provided some meaningful minutes, I should say, for the L.A. Rams secondary. And uh, I think he's improved their overall production. There are some other areas and elements of the secondary where I do have my concerns, okay? But when it comes to Nick Scott, I'm not concerned. When it comes to Jalen Ramsey, I'm not concerned. When it comes to Eric Weddle, I'm not concerned. Um, so he's been, an, I think, a, a much needed addition to their secondary. Uh, Eric Weddle walking off the street to play in the playoffs right? and now in the Super Bowl. I just... <laughs> I, I was just gonna I was gonna mention that, but I gotta ask, how crazy is that to be able to do? It's a testament to I think uh, how smart he is as a player. You know, the late great Vince Lombardi said that ninety percent of the game is played from the neck up. We all have our physical gifts, our physical tools, but the ability to understand the game, the X's and O's, it allows you to play uh, faster and see things and anticipate at a much higher rate. Then those players who don't put the time in, don't understand formations down in distance, personnel grouping. That's where Eric Weddle has always really been good. He works as well with the coaching staff as I've ever seen any player, right? Average talent, but have tremendous ability from the neck up. And then the attention and time that he puts in when it comes to studying the game plan and communicating it, right? To yeah. The other defensive backs back there, uh, I think that's where he brings more to the table than most defensive backs in the NFL. Do you see similar things from Nick Scott as far as the way he plays the game? Yeah, and he's a young player, but he's very smart, and he also has versatility to his game, not just as a safety, but as a nickel-dime defender. Um, he's really good in man-to-man -man coverage against tight ends or maybe backs coming out of the backfield. And I think he's you know, a phenomenal player in terms of his – uh, what he's learning, right, from guys like Jalen Ramsey and Eric Weddle. And those guys, I know for a fact, love working with younger players. And so you can tell he's putting the time in because he's making more plays. His anticipation, okay, pre-snap is where I think he's leveraging his talents uh, to be a better player. He's just only going to get better the more that he sees the field. 
Uh, not many shows give you the in-depth coverage of the Rams defense by starting with Nick Scott at safety rather than starting up front with Aaron Donald or, you know, Von Miller. Uh, but really, you know, that whole defense and the way that that secondary works with their a lot of two high safety shells as we're discussing those two players at that position. A lot of the engine is driven by the guys up front, right? Oh, absolutely. It starts with Aaron Donald, a guy that. You can't even block him half the time. Uh, he, he's hard to even double team. And you have to commit resources if you are going to neutralize Aaron Donald at the line of scrimmage and a lot, not allow him penetration into your backfield. And the more resources you allocate toward him, now you're putting yourself in jeopardy for Von Miller off the edge to just destroy any uh, offensive tackles trying to block him one-on-one. Leonard Floyd can win one-on-one battles as well. And so it all starts with Aaron Donald in the middle. Um, this is going to be the best defensive front I think the Cincinnati Bengals have seen all season long. And that's saying a lot. Yeah, you mentioned earlier this week on a different radio hit about the quarterback being the most dependent position on the field when it comes to football. So with that in mind and the offensive line, you just mentioned that. How do you see that matchup between the Rams defensive line and the Bengals offensive line? Well, I, I see the Bengals offensive line having their work cut out. For them. <laughs> Not a great day. <laughs> you know, look, if they and they didn't, I don't think they gave up all nine of the sacks that occurred in that Titans game. I think Joe Burrow would tell you he could have got rid of the ball. Um, to avoid a few you know, look his job was really to not turn the ball over in those moments not panic and it's okay to take a sack on first down so he did contribute to that total Bengals offensive line isn't that bad where you're nine sacks given up well they're not all on on the old line now with that said they did give up a league high 51 sacks during the regular season Joe Burrow has proven that he can play above any deteriorations uh, with his offensive line. After giving up 51 sacks during the regular season, Joe Burrow went on to complete a higher percentage of his passes um, than any other quarterback in the NFL while pushing the ball further down the field per pass attempt than any other quarterback in the NFL. So he has really showed that he can rise above the imperfections of his offensive line. In fact, that he can make them better. That's what great quarterbacks do now. Mm-hmm. Okay, they don't play down to the level of the situation and environment around them. They have a tendency to play above it and then ri- uh, lift others with them. And that's what he's done to this offense. You know, he doesn't play down to the 51 sacks allowed. He has risen above it in terms of his overall production and ability to win games. Dr. El Sadiq, I don't want to leave you out of the discussion here. Do you have any thoughts on, on Joe Burrow and how the Bengals have played so far this season? You know, all I can say is it's it's kind of amazing to see uh, what he's done two years uh, in and in, in getting into the Super Bowl. You know, I think everybody up until now were thinking that Bengals uh, were a long shot. But if you actually look at what they've done in each game when they went into Tennessee Titans and taking the interception, that was like snatching the wind uh, from the from the yeah. Titans. Um, you know, I think that they deserve to be here. And, you know, like Solomon was saying, Nobody was saying that the Rams is an unbeatable team. Uh, and the fact that the Titans beat the Rams and now the Bengals are with the Rams, I think it's going to be an interesting game. And it's going to be given to whoever can play the most, uh, uh, you know, um, overall uh, distributed and balanced game. And, and uh, Solomon, he brings up a good point about how uh, the Bengals, I don't think anyone's surprised they took a step forward this year. A, a young, talented offense, T. Higgins, Jamar Chase, Tyler Boyd. Of course, they've got Joe Mixon in the backfield. C.J. Uzama came on this year. But this is a bit of a surprise. Being in the Super Bowl, being getting all the way to the end here to the, to the final prize, uh, what has been the spark? Is it just Joe Burrow, or what is it about this team that you've seen got them to this point? Well, I think it's a complimentary style of play. I think it starts with Joe because he's been so productive. He has such charisma and such confidence that um, you have to follow that. And if you look at most of these free agent players who have signed, right, most of them come on defense. Uh, you ask them why are they – here they'll tell you number nine they believe in joe burrow um whether it's trey hendrickson came over in free agency um whether it is larry ogan joby comes over in free agency 
um, whether it is Vaughn Bell, who's added to this defense this past uh, offseason, as well as Mike Hilton. They'll all tell you um, what intrigued them about the Bengals in free agency was their new young quarterback, Jaburro. And so, yeah, he's been a force multiplier, not just by what he's doing on the field, but the way that, that he inspires others to sign up, not only to sign up, but to believe that they can win. Yeah. And so it is in that way that he's a force multiplier. But listen, it's a, it's a defense that can pressure your quarterback as well. We know about the Rams' pass rush, but Trey Hendrickson, Sam Hubbard, and their interior defensive linemen make a lot of plays, right? Have four yeah. sacks in the FC title game against Patrick Mahomes, and they've ended every single postseason game with an interception on defense. Never forget that. They know how to close out games. So one minute, it's the defense getting interceptions and getting sacks to close out games. Another minute, it's Joe Mixon in the run game closing it out. Another minute, it's Joe Burrow in the passing game. Another minute, it's special teams. It's a rookie kicker by the name of Evan McPherson, who's had four field goals made in each of their three postseason games so far this year, averaging 12 points per game. So pick your poison. That's why we, That's why many of us, we believe the Bengals are going to win. And we're not even shy about saying that they, they have certainly felt like a team, not just on the rise, but a wave coming to the Super Bowl here. Uh, former NFL safety, former Cincinnati Bengals, Solomon Wilcots on the BWI Daily Edition. This has got to be a special week for you, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. When your former team makes it and uh, they've struggled for so many years, right? Even though they've come close with Carson Palmer and, and Andy Dalton. Um, seven trips to the postseason um, under, you know, um, their former head coach, Marvin Lewis, but still couldn't win once they got there. And, and then they go out and get Zach Taylor. And, right, uh, Zach Taylor had only won six games in the previous two years. And now he's totally surpassed that total in 2021 and, and just four quarters shy of winning the franchise, their first Super Bowl trophy. So quick turnaround. They've done some great things. I know a lot of people are shocked. I'm not shocked. You know, am I surprised? Yes, but certainly not shocked. Uh, we haven't really talked about the Rams offense and a good segue between Zach Taylor then and Sean McVay and this this uh, former uh, Shanahan offense that has proliferated through the NFL. What do you see from them and the difference with the Rams offense with Matt Stafford versus what it was previously with Jared Goff? Yeah, that's a good question. I think... Um, Sean McVay, I think a, the team, they had lost confidence in Jarrett Goff's ability to take whatever play is given to them, whatever play he's given that's scripted, and elevate that play, right? If you're designed to get a first down here, he gets your first down. If you're designed to move the chains or, you know, not take a loss and just dump it and throw away, he's going to dump it and throw it away. But the ability to elevate the offense, right? Yeah. Take it to a whole nother level. Listen, I draw up the plays as a coach. I put you in a position to make the play. You got to make the play. You got to stick the landing. And uh, there were too many times I saw him watch, I mean, walk back over to the sideline and Sean McVay's pulling his hair out. Like, what are you doing? Why'd you do that? Why'd you check to this? I just think they felt like they could do better. The rest of the team was waiting for the quarterback. Okay, you got an Aaron Donald. You got a Jalen Ramsey. These guys don't have a whole rest of their careers to wait for you to get it right at quarterback. Right. Uh, so they went out and, and traded for a, what we call a known commodity. I mean, we knew who Matthew Stafford was. He could play, right? And it, it the skill set's there. So that's what Sean McVay wanted, went out and felt like he was a good fit for their offense. And now Matthew Stafford is just four quarters away from becoming this year's Tom Brady, changing the team. You know, after one year, parachuting into a locker room and having these guys trust you, and now you lead them all the way to the Super Bowl, playing in your very own home stadium. Tom Brady did that just one year ago. And now Matthew Stafford's trying to do it just four games, four quarters shy, I should say, four quarters of duplicating it. Man, that could set a trend now. We may have to be yeah. careful. We, we, haven't seen, 
we hadn't seen it before, I don't think, where, or at least in a very long time where the home team won the Super Bowl, and now we've got the opportunity back-to-back. -back. Uh, I want to I make sure we get all, Dr. Al-Sadiq in here to talk about uh, BioHeart. So tell us about uh, what you guys are talking about today and what BioHeart, this heart rate monitor, can do for people. Yeah, sure. So, you know, one of the things that we saw, and, and I'm sure you've seen it as well, and there's been athletes that um, have had issues in high school, college, um, and even in at the professional level. Uh, and really this stems because cardiac disease is the number one killer. And so what we saw was that there's a lot of innovation in cardiac care, but really uh, collecting data is, is very manual. You only get 30 seconds of your data through your Apple Watch, and you have to manually collect it. And so we're a medical device company, and we took our medical diagnostic technology and made it available for consumers so that you can collect your data over long periods of time, so days, weeks, months, um, you know, because uh, cardiac issues are intermittent. They happen while you're sleeping. Um, you could be watching a game and, and, and something is going on. And so uh, we created the BioHeart, and this is something that you wear, and while you're wearing it, it's constantly recording and collecting data. And then you can uh, get a summary of that data and share it with your doctor and figure out what's going on. And so, uh, you know, it, it comes from that medical device background, but to try and make it available, it's a game changer. Um, before this, you, you would not be able to collect long-term data uh, in a consumer non-prescription environment. And so, you know, we think it's great for sports fans. We think it's great for the athletes. We think it's great. And, you know, the product was launched in November, and this is kind of our first time to uh, bring it out. And we saw in, in Europe that EuroCup's uh, player that dropped in the middle of the game. So, you know, we felt it was time to uh, introduce it into the sports circle. Yep, Penn State had a player last year, Journey Brown, who had to medically retire after uh, he was found to have myocarditis. So uh, top of mind for a lot of Penn State fans. If people want to learn more information, they're not maybe a peak physical athlete like Solomon, who's still in great shape. Uh, where can people go get information about this so they can, uh, they can find out more about uh, BioHeart? Yeah, you can go to BioHeart.com and uh, you can go on Amazon and, and also get it from there. And uh, it's just something that's great for you, your loved ones, or anybody um, that wants to, you know, uh, improve their performance. Solomon Wilcox, Dr. Wasak Al-Sadiq, thank you so much for coming on the BWI Daily Edition. Thomas, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you.